Good morning. My name is Katie Peterson, and I'm a research fellow and associate director of the Water Policy Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. Welcome to our virtual program today, featuring the results of our latest survey on groundwater recharge in the San Joaquin Valley. The report, technical appendices, and slides from today's briefing can be found on our website at ppic.org. This research and event are supported with funding from the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the Kingfisher Foundation, or the Lower Isle Foundation, Sustainable Conservation, and the Water Foundation. We'd like to thank them for their support. For today's program, I will present some of the main findings from the report. I'll then turn it over to my colleague, Ellen Hannock, who will lead a discussion on how conditions for recharge have changed since 2017 and what remains to be done to continue building on the progress made for this critical water supply tool. Ellen will then open it up to questions from the audience for the final 15 minutes of the program. So if you have a question for our speakers, please send it along with your name and organization to the email address on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. As a reminder, PPIC is a public charity and does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. And now on to the presentation. So I'm going to briefly present some of the main highlights from our recent report, Replenishing Groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley. We're interested in this question because as we know, the San Joaquin Valley has some of the biggest groundwater overdraft problems to deal with. Now, reducing demand for groundwater is going to be part of addressing that overdraft, but there's also a lot of interest in taking advantage of opportunities to do more recharge. Now, there are many actors in the region that have been doing this for some time, but we wanted to know how do we scale that up and get more agencies involved. So through a survey, we looked at groundwater recharge in two recent wet years, 2017 and 2023. And 2023 was a timely moment to revisit that survey because a lot of things have changed in the groundwater recharge landscape since 2017. To start with, groundwater sustainability agencies are now fully formed and they've taken on major coordination rules in their basins. Groundwater sustainability plans are also complete and our review of those plans showed that many, if not most of them, placed heavy priority on recharge as a supply side strategy for eliminating groundwater overdraft. In fact, taking collectively, they had a goal of approximately 1 million acre feet of an average increase in recharge over current levels. And that's an average across wet and dry years. So as you can see in the maps on the right, the San Joaquin Valley does have big overdraft problems. But in the right hand panel, you can see that conveniently, it also has a lot of potential for recharge. Um, and the green and yellow portions of those donut charts are showing you where there's really good soil suitability for groundwater recharge. Recharge did expand in 2023, so it's great news. Um, we, saw, we had similar overall levels of precipitation in 2017 and 2023. Of course, no two years are exactly identical, but this is really helpful for comparison purposes. There are also more agencies recharging, 79% of those responding to our survey in 2023 compared to 75% in 2017. And volumes are up. We had reports of 5.3 million acre feet of recharge water stored on site um, and estimate about 7.6 million acre feet of recharge valley wide. And this is a rough estimate, but it is consistent with a few different methods we use to cross check our data. So we're comfortable saying there has been an increase, although the exact numbers are give or take. Many of you will have seen the groundwater conditions report published by the Department of Water Resources, in which GSAs are reporting slightly lower numbers as part of their annual accounting. This reflects that some recharge may have happened in the fall after the end of the official water year. We captured that in the survey, but it was not captured in those reports to DWR. And some GSAs probably didn't report recharge from some of the more informal methods, some of which can be difficult to track precisely. So we'll look at this next. Rechargers used broadly similar methods in both 2017 and 2023. Roughly half used the top four methods that you'll see in this chart, starting with in lieu or substituting surface water for groundwater pumping. 
um, as seen for recharge basins or dedicated recharge basins. Also roughly half were using the more traditional passive methods of running recharge water through unlined canals or stream beds and also spreading water on farmland. And in this category, we're including active cropland, fallowed land, and to a lesser extent, floodplains and open space lands. As I said, some of these methods are more formal than others, and not everyone tracks the volumes that are applied for every method. The key charge to note, the key change to note here is really that the increase in the number of people using recharge basins, which is consistent with reports we've had of investments in this in this method and this infrastructure. So the previous figure was showing you the share of survey respondents using a given method for recharge. This figure is now showing you the actual volume that was reported as applied using that method. So you can see that again, the biggest volume of recharge water was applied in dedicated basins or about 2.8 million acre feet. That's up from 2017, as are the volumes for in lieu recharge, which were at about 1.3 million acre feet in 2023. The biggest percent increase, actually this, this volume almost doubled, was for spreading water on farmland uh, at about half a million acre feet this past year. Although, as you can see, that doesn't account for still for much of the total volume of recharge. And then you can see for off-site recharge, which in this case is referring to banking partnerships that occur elsewhere, uh, the volumes reported are about the same between 2017 and 23, or about half a million acre feet there as well. So 2023 saw pretty good progress, but could we have done more? To understand this, we looked at all the water that actually left the valley. In other words, it wasn't captured upstream and instead went into the delta. And then we subtracted out the water that wasn't required to meet environmental flow requirements and would not impact downstream users. That left us with a conservative estimate of 3.5 million acre feet of water potentially still on the table in 2023. That's the orange in the figure that you see on the right, or water that would have been safe to recharge. More could have been exported to about 0.4 million acre feet. Of course, both these metrics assume that there is capacity south of the delta to store and distribute that water for recharge. But clearly more could have been done, and it makes sense to think about where we could make improvements. So here I'm gonna briefly revisit six priorities that rose to the top in 2017. We wanna look at them now in light of these new survey results. First, refining the rules on when and how much water can be diverted. The state has been working towards gaining a better understanding of flows. There's been a lot of movement on making more water available. The executive orders from the governor's office were a good example of something that was very helpful in the moment. And now there's ongoing work to refine that in the legislation. Similar story for the state board's temporary permit process. However, there's still work to be done to figure out when we're not in those extreme flood flow states, what water could still be safely used for recharge. There are a number of promising inputs on that point. Uh, there's the state analysis of the San Joaquin River coming up, the suite of watershed studies forthcoming from DWR. There's also the California Environmental Flows Framework analysis on understanding flows. And there's also promising poli policy discussions coming up. We're seeing the beginnings of broader stakeholder engagement, for example, around discussions on legislation authorizing flood flow diversions. Addressing other regulatory barriers. So in our 2017 results, managers were particularly concerned about difficulties acquiring permits to construct and operate new projects. And these issues were still very much on the radar in 2023. Managers referenced frustrations with a lack of coordination among different permitting agencies, especially regarding regulatory requirements like installing fish screens on diversions or rules against using pumps on some canals. And there were concerns that these requirements are making opportunistic recharge efforts from flood flows unrealistic. Then there are price disincentives occurring uh, for use, using CVP water for recharge in a wet year after a serious drought. The Central Valley Project has to recoup lost revenues and it sets its prices for recharge water accordingly. This is an issue with the business model that was also flagged in 2017 and is still uh, considered a barrier more recently. So generally, we've, we're seeing persistent problems getting projects permitted 
and more institutional alignment, more flexible regulatory approaches would help across the board. Easing infrastructure constraints. So we've seen plenty of progress on building local projects. And many of those were built with state support as well. That's evident, you can see that in our results concerning increased, increased capacity for dedicated recharge basins, for example. But it was still viewed as a major barrier to doing more, to doing more recharge. So the next step would then be to continue looking at ways to invest in infrastructure, looking at options for optimizing surface storage's role, for example, and helping to slow water down. And also key is going to be a regional look at what are the smart plays on conveyance. And that's especially true for those projects that are going to require collaborations across GSAs and across basins. Groundwater accounting. It is difficult to overstate how much progress has been made on groundwater accounting methods. Um, and this is a critical piece of managing groundwater sustainable, uh, sustainably. And the results from our survey, we found that most of the folks who are actively doing recharge, or about 81%, were using at least one accounting method, um, like remote sensing or direct measurement or modeling of some, or of some sort. Two thirds were using more than one method. And everybody who was reporting volumes in the survey um, tracked groundwater in some way, usually with multiple methods. So this is great news. And we also think that in overdrafted basins, accounting systems can go one step further. And that's by establishing pumping allocations for individual users. We found that folks that were early adopters of allocations have also done really well on recharge. And that just goes to show that allocations until very recently had this punitive connotation, but it's increasingly recognized that they can also be a valuable incentive tool. Allocations also facilitate groundwater trading and banking, which can reduce costs for users and also help manage risks from drought. Accelerating the rollout of recharge on farmland. In just the last six years, it feels like this has moved from an experimental approach to much more of the mainstream. And there's a lot of interest in this in places where just a few years ago, it would have been a non-starter. Many rechargers are using some kind of incentive system to encourage landowners to spread water on their land. There are a couple examples of the kinds of incentives being used in the chart on the right. And many others said that they're developing these programs and they're intending to roll them out soon. We're seeing fewer technical difficulties referenced um, things like problems with irrigation systems not being compatible are not as much of an issue, it seems. There's less concern about recharge on farm landing impacting crop yields, but there's still more to do to increase grower familiarity with these techniques, to improve tracking and accounting of this method, and just to meet the growing grower demand for crediting programs. And finally, continuing to build partnerships. We've seen a lot of growth in this in the past six years, especially within GSAs, some of whom have been sharing water, sharing infrastructure, partnering on other projects. A couple of areas to emphasize looking ahead are gonna include those multi-benefit recharge projects, including projects that are have some element of flood control. And it'd also be important to emphasize offsite banking partnerships because these help growers manage risk and they're also really helpful for areas that don't have great recharge suitability or capacity. So just some final thoughts. We've seen a lot of change and advances on groundwater recharge in six short years, which is an encouraging sign. And tackling the remaining barriers head on can really keep that momentum going and help make both wet and dry years easier to manage as the Valley works towards groundwater sustainability. So with that, I'll say thank you. And I'll remind you that if you have questions about this presentation or about the panel discussion to come, please seen, send them with your name and organization to PPIC event questions at gmail.com. With that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Ellen Hannock, who's going to moderate the panel discussion, senior fellow at the Water Policy Center. Take it away, Ellen. Hi, thank you, Katie. Um, that was a great overview. And it is now my privilege to invite an incredible group of panelists to the stage. I'm going to start with Stephanie Nagnuson, Director of Water and Natural Resources for Madera County. And next is Jeevan Muhar, 
who is the engineer manager at the Arvin Edison Water Storage District down in Southeast Kern County. Then John Ryder, who is a farmer and solar developer with McConnell Farms and um, wears a few hats. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Welcome, John. And then last but not least, Stephen Springhorn, who is with the Department of Water Resources and has is in the is the, the manager in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office at DWR, um, in charge of technical assistance. But I can safely say he's been accompanying Sigma since the outset from DWR, um, and so has has uh, a lot has seen a lot and 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 has I think probably folks on the, uh, other folks on the screen have have uh, seen seen Stephen and worked with him in various capacities. So welcome everybody. Um, and glad to have you aboard. So I, I, I want us to start with um, a bit of a sort of your views from you know where you sit and from 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 the ground from on the ground of kind of what you saw in 2023 that was new and different. Um, and I just, you know, for the audience to, to know, we've got at the local level, we've got folks who are really representing a range of different kinds of, of situations from, you know, Jeevan's been involved in groundwater, his agency is the one of the first who doing doing groundwater banking in, in, in the state. Um, Stephanie is managing a place that is groundwater only and um, really looking for water. And John is kind of all over the place. I'll let you tell people, John, when, when it's your turn, uh, your different perspectives. But so maybe Stephanie, let's start with you as somebody from a, from a groundwater only GSA. Sure. Well, because we have allocations and a groundwater accounting system, we had people who were very, very eager to take water. Um, so we saw some differences. I started in 2018, so I just heard about 2017. But one thing that seemed really different is that people used to think recharge could only be done with grapes. And, and this time we saw waters going on almonds and pistachio trees. And so that's really helpful that they're experimenting and trying new crops. Um, in addition, really good coordination this time around with our lower San Joaquin Levy District and the Madera County Flood Control Agency, which we manage. So just good coordination and because of the groundwater accounting, lots of people taking water. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Jeevan, how about you down in your neck of the woods? Yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned our geography. We are uniquely situated where um, Arvin Edison is essentially, our intake canal is the extension of the Frank Kern Canal. We have our abilities to get water from um, the West Side the State Water Project, West Side CVP, and then locally, Kern River Water. And so we, we had access to all those facilities. What we've uh, continued to do is, is have additional interconnections. Um, we mentioned the um, partnerships and collaboration. We, we work real closely with a lot of our local agencies. And, and one new one for us that I thought was very interesting, um, our, our um, sister agency, um, Kern Delta, has been running water in their canal system for over 100 years. And when we came in 60 years ago, we crossed them. And, and last year, we had a facility that was completed, another interconnection where we were able to put friant molecules in, in Kern Delta's canal system and, and spread water to new facilities that we built jointly together. Um, that allowed us to bring about an additional 20,000 acre feet uh, compared to 2017 and to 2023. Um, so we continue to to build on inter, on uh, new new infrastructure, um, including on farm recharge. We did more of that. Uh, we incentivized some of our growers uh, to farm with water. We paid them forty dollars an acre foot uh, to put water on fallow fields. Um, we continue to expand our areas where there's groundwater only, um, and continue to build our pipeline systems to areas so they can take water. And uh, that was an additional 15,000 acre feet. And so overall between 2017 uh, compared to 2017, we actually imported an additional 35,000 acre feet and set a record um, last year as far as importing water into our district. And then towards the tail end, uh, another neat project. Um, we worked with the state of California and actually got three of our Caltrans basins 
hooked up to be able to take water um, uh, and and utilize you know an existing essentially resource that was sitting right next to us and started to put water in into these basins. Um, so we, we you know we continue to expand on what we've done in the past and um, collaborate and, and build new facilities. That's great. Thanks, Jeevan. Okay, John, over to you and your what you've seen in your yes. tour of the valley. So I'm largely involved in uh, western and eastern Fresno County and in southern and Kern County, right next door to Jeevan in Wheeler Ridge. And what I've seen two key things uh, evolve since Sigma's passed since 2017. Um, and one is the development of landowner recharge programs. And I'll go into a couple of examples. Um, and then secondly is the evolving market for uh, buying water uh, for recharge um, in, in, advance, in a wet year in anticipation and, and in preparation for dry years. So on landowner recharge, I think what I've seen is that there are water agencies that have varying degrees of expertise and experience with uh, recharge, but that didn't appear to be a blocker. Um, and I think that this is consistent with the PPIC report that Katie presented earlier. Um, I think the common theme is that for a recharge program to be successful, it needs to have incentives. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples where I think that this went well, and then a, a, an example where it's still a work in progress. Um, so starting in Southern Kern in Wheeler Ridge, I've been on the board there uh, since 2017. Um, and we have a long history of banking water in Kern. Uh, we're a, 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 a part owner in the Kern Water Bank. We have interest in other Kern fan projects. So our landowners, our staff, our board is very familiar with measuring, accounting for, uh, trading of, of credits. Um, and so we were pretty well positioned to launch a landowner program. This 2023 is the first time that we did it in district. And that was largely because we realized how much water was going to come from the Delta. And then also a, a huge year um, in the Southern Sierras uh, that that resulted in uh, significant flows off the Kern, uh, the Kern River. And so within 30 days of really having an initial discussion about it, we started a program uh, for landowners. Uh, they had to identify the lands that they wanted to store water on. And they, uh, once it got approved by staff, um, landowners would get paid for, just like what Jeevan mentioned, would get paid for uh, recharging on their property. Um, midway through the summer, we got feedback from landowners who said we'd like to generate credits. And so we, we, we modified the program to allow both. Um, secondly, I would mention Westlands. Um, Westlands had almost no history of banking or recharge um, uh, at the district level uh, in its history. And in 2022, a new board was elected that basically focus its platform on recharge. And when 2020, they were, they were all, half of the board were new directors. And uh, when 2023 started to become a wet year, uh, they very quickly jumped into action and uh, they launched a landowner recharge program. Uh, and it had three elements. You can do private recharge for credits. You can take uh, payments from the district, or we had a 50-50 program where the district paid for the water, the landowners provided the land, and then they split the, the credits 50-50. It was, it was a little bit of a slow start, but um, by the end of the CDP water year, uh, it was a huge success. Uh, and basically they went from zero to 400,000 acre feet um, between 2017 and 2023, and it was a huge success. Um, and the, the last example I will give you is on the, is in Eastern Fresno County and that's consolidated irrigation district where there, the district has a, a long history of district level recharge. They had a very successful 2023, uh, in terms of storing about 300,000 acre feet into the King's sub basin a couple of years prior in 2021, a group of growers, um, 
launched an effort to have a landowner recharge program to increase the, the volume of water that we could recharge in the basin. And um, it didn't get off the ground other than a voluntary program. And as it turns out, without incentives, a voluntary program wasn't as successful as we had hoped for um, in our district. Um, and so we're working on um, a program. Uh, in fact, there's a board meeting tomorrow. And we're working on a program to uh, try to uh, launch incentives for landowners to store. The, the last thing I would just mention is that um, what I've seen uh, that that is a huge change is Really, prior to Sigma, prior to the, the drought that started in 2013, a lot of recharge and banking activity had to do with flood flows and Article 21 water or Section 215 water off the aqueduct. And I think that the big change that I've seen in the last few years is um, when um, there's water available in the system, um, water agencies and landowners are acquiring water simply to store it in the ground. And as I said earlier, to prepare for dry years. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. And thanks to all, all three of you at the local level. So now, Stephen, DWR has been busy too. <laughs> and I guess, you know, we definitely heard in the survey that there were there were some things that folks appreciated quite a bit in the moment, in addition to some of the support that the state had provided in, in advance. Um, just would love you to sort of give a give a sense of, you know, from where you sit, what what did you see that was new and different in in what your agency was doing or, you know, uh, others. Yeah, well, I wanted to first thank uh, you, Ellen and uh, Katie and the PPIC team, because I think it's it's been uh, events like this, reports like this that bring us together to understand what worked and what didn't. And so I think that that was is really great. And I think we need more of that uh, to continue uh, capitalizing on the opportunities like that was in the system in 2023. So. You know, I think, yeah, 2023 was a banner year. And from the perspective of looking across the state, which uh, our view is at DWR, look, working with a whole host of different entities, um, we saw it was a banner year. And there was a record amount of, of managed recharge that was uh, that occurred, as Katie mentioned, and we saw it and reported on it as well. And I think it just reflects that, that that wasn't just a moment in time. It was all, It was a decade worth of hard work uh, and really that Sigma put a lot of folks on that trajectory uh, and hundreds of millions of dollars of state investment, a lot of work uh, in the planning, implementation and operation of these projects that Katie showed that uh, weren't there in the last really wet year and that are here now and more are in the pipeline. And so I think that was a really uh, has been something that sort of gets overshadowed a bit, but it's the day in and day out work by, you know, the local entities on this call and hundreds of them across the state. So I think that was really encouraging to see. And there's really a purpose, a common purpose now under, with uh, Sigma in place, a very clear view of what has to happen in each basin to get to sustainability and maintain it. And so now, uh, there's a lot of interest, of, as we've seen, uh, for action on recharge, uh, as well as other um, projects that will get these GSAs to sustainability. So I think a couple of things that stood out specifically um, from the state level, um, I, I've, I've been working uh, for the state for since 2005, and I think I, I've never seen this level of support at the highest levels of state government. You know, from the governor to Secretary Crowfoot to our director and other state leaders to really put an emphasis on uh, Sigma number one with you know almost $800 million worth of investment over these last almost 10 years, but really with flood capture and recharge, trying to blend two emergencies into one so they can benefit each other as much as possible. Um, and so I would say that that was, that was a big thing that stood out. Um, high level support uh, and a clear direction or metric of uh, getting 500,000 acre feet average annual in the water supply strategy. Um, now that doesn't sound like a lot in a year that was reported 4.1 million acre feet. However, that metric was put out there in the, the summer of 2022 
in the water supply strategy when we are still in intense drought. So it just shows some of the proactive steps and there's more that needs to be done, obviously, but it's showing that in order to get through drought, we have to be able to utilize the flood water when it is in the system. And that was shown by a, a, a ton of action on the ground. So I think that mentality really stood out. Uh, and then uh, Stephanie hit on it already and others as well as the connecting the flood managers with the groundwater managers. And for in some cases, those existing relationships um, are there and they've been there for decades. But in many places now with new GSAs, relatively new GSAs, um, there is a lot of opportunity there for those emerging relationships that we saw a lot of on display in 2023 and continuing on. And there's a lot of opportunity there, which is exciting. And so trying to find ways to find those areas for partnership, incentivize those, as was mentioned, um, going forward uh, to really maximize um, the, um, the benefit out of any type of emergency, whether it's drought or flood. Uh, and then I think that's that just goes into the last thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, we have some overlapping timelines and efforts that are merging. So we have the long sort of marathon, but some people I'm sure feel like it's a sprint for 10 years now of Sigma and a lot of action that's been going on, clear metrics or clearer metrics now for people to shoot for um, and purpose to find water when it's there uh, and to to do demand reduction when it's needed, but then you have that overlapping with the short-term emergency response. And so something that really was born out of this um, last drought and flood um, sort of shift, extreme shift from one to the other, is within the department, our director uh, is really aligning our all of us across the department, whether it's our groundwater team, our flood team, state water project, multi-benefit groups, to really try and get our house in order, as our director likes to say, so we can be the best partners possible to local agencies, to other uh, state agencies and federal agencies, so that we can come to the table ready to, with a full suite of possibility or tools uh, to figure out what are the pilots that need to be done? What are the things we need to advance? So I think that is really highlighting you know, it, it's the saying is a problem well defined is half solved. Um, and that's really important because there's a lot of complexity and a lot of issues with what we're talking about today. And so the more that we get what's happening on the ground, what are the issues, what are the roadblocks, the more that there's high levels of attention all the way to the very top in state government, to try and figure out how we can get through those because we know the need is there. So I think those are the big things that stick out uh, in my mind. Thanks, Stephen. And in some ways, you're you're starting to you're pivoting towards the forward looking what needs to still happen. And that that's going to be the the theme of what I want us to to talk about now, which is, you know, a, a, there's been a lot of progress, but there's clearly more work to be done, um, both at the local level and and by the state. Um, and in thinking about expanding the valley's capacity to to recharge when when water is available. So. I, I'd like now to ask, I'm going to go around the, the room here and, and ask each of you to give two top priorities, one of them for local action and one for state action when you think about unleashing the, the still untapped potential for, for recharge. Stephanie, I want, to, I want to start with you. Sure. I mean, I think locally, if people can embrace the idea of a water budget or an allocation and an accounting system, you would be able to create incentives and get a lot more water in the ground. And for a long time, allocations were sort of seen as something only, you know, folks like us who represent the completely groundwater dependent would need to do. But really, water budgets, allocations are something that really everybody in the state, I think, will be on at some point. It's how you manage your water. Um, and then from a state perspective, uh, more clarity regarding um, SB 122, and a lot of folks are working on this now, but there's some language in there that probably needs a little bit of, of fine tuning. For example, um, with land repurposing, we have lots of acres that will come out of production, but if they've been out of production more than three years, I don't think they would be able to, um, to take water according to SB 122. Um, also, Steph Stephanie, sorry, just clarify for folks yeah. SB 122 what it is. 
Uh, it is sort of an extension in law of much of what was in the executive order. So the executive order was letting us take flood flows when lands were at risk of inundation and SB 122 put that into law. But then of course, as everything shifts, there were some new little language tweaks. So another tweak is the idea of new infrastructure and exactly what that is. For example, if we've had grants and we've designed something and built it, but never used it, is it really new infrastructure? Um, I would argue it's not, but there's there's language issues within that that could be fine too. Great, thank you. Um, Jeevan, how about you? Local, local priority, state priority. Sure, locally, um, you know, we gotta continue to fix our existing infrastructure uh, and protect it. Um, you know, while Franklin Canal has fixed its phase one uh, project, getting us historical flows, we continue to see some subsidence and uh, got to get that arrested and get that fixed uh, so that folks like Arvin, which are downstream and take big bulks, big gulps of water during these big years, uh, we got to continue to have access to that water. Um, and then statewide, um, you know, almost on the same theme, uh, conveyance, there's there's opportunities to to build new conveyance to areas that are groundwater only now, um, including, you know, to irrigated acres or even wetlands. Um, and, and that may require some some money from the state uh, or the feds to help kickstart some of those conveyances statewide. And for those that um, aren't aware, I think that uh, the San Joaquin Valley Water Blueprint is an area that is working on some of that stuff um, that's statewide and uh, uh, would definitely uh, have folks go onto their website and, and learn more about the blueprint. Great, thank you, Jeevan. John, what say you? So I think local level, no surprise, I, I think um, GSAs and districts should be looking at landowner recharge programs with incentives. Uh, the When you look at the 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 numbers, it's the lowest cost means of storing water in the ground. Um, and I think there are different circumstances for every different regions, whether it's soils or the methodology for measuring, um, whatever would work for your area, I think focus on that and and roll out a pilot program. And it, what the, the I think one point I would make is don't let perfect be the enemy of good on programs because you can modify them over time and, and you're gonna to need to modify them over time and be adaptable. Um, at the state level, I think in years like 2023, I think it's really critical to have early and frequent allocation announcements because they're um, going into 23, uh, landowners and water agencies have water stored in, in San Luis Reservoir um, there's, you know, an early allocation and that water could be moved out of the reservoir and and um, stored underground um, if there is notice. And I think that the combination of monthly allocation announcements and then monthly board cycles, there's um, there's a lost opportunity to be to optimize the system. Great, thank you all. So Stephen, Stephen, you're in the hot seat now. Um, I, I definitely wanna hear from you about what your top priorities are, but I also wanna give you the opportunity to react to any of the asks that folks have for the state. Um, yeah, I think what's really nice and, and another example of all the, the work that's been done over the last decade of Sigma implementation and last you know, six to seven years of flood mar and, and everything else that's been going on is there's been a lot of this active coordination, you know, more is needed. But I think we're getting to the point where we're able to be talking to each other more effectively. So a lot of the the priorities that each panelist talked about, those are aligning with where we're headed and with this at the state. Um, and so I think that's exciting. And so I think, you know, the priorities I was planning to talk about today are really aligned with what what each panelist brought up. And so from the local perspective, you know, the engine of action is at the local level in Sigma, right? And we saw it firsthand in 2023 and and uh, it's been on ever every day since and, and before that. And so I think that's how so much water was able to be captured 
in a really wet year is because of that long-term day in and day out work. And so what that means is there's a hundreds of projects that are that are planned um, or in the pipeline or that have been constructed or revamped or used. And so, you know, we've taken a look, there's over 350 recharge related projects across the groundwater sustainability plans. And each one of those projects represents an opportunity for success, but also a lot of hurdles, right? So the, I think a priority in my mind from, for a local action is locals keep doing what they're doing, but raise up those issues. And that has been happening more and more because if we don't know about the issues, again, it's hard to solve them. Um, and so I think that's a, a really important local action is to really push forward, try and maximize the use of a lot of um, streamlining and other infrastructure related initiatives that are going on that the governor and the secretary and others across the state are working on. So trying to showcase that the groundwater world is a ripe opportunity for infrastructure improvements, which you know that's uh, clearly defined or clearly on display in Sigma. And then from the state perspective, <clears throat> I would just echo what was already said is infrastructure, right? And thinking about infrastructure in more than just the traditional way, but the traditional infrastructure is, is very important. You know, we need our backbone infrastructure that's going to be more interregional um, or so we can get water to places where maybe uh, Southern California, like we saw in 2023, was very wet. But Northern California really wasn't at a historic wet, you know, uh, runoff. And this last year, it sort of flipped. And so there's definitely um, operational constraints when we don't have as efficient of uh, statewide backbone infrastructure in place. Then you go to regional infrastructure that's needed that was discussed, and then local or the last mile type of infrastructure to really get it uh, to where it needs to go or can go. And then I think not just because I'm a geologist or I work in on Sigma, uh, but we need to be re rethinking how we uh, approach groundwater basins because they represent an order of magnitude more storage than our surface water uh, reservoirs, but they're hard to define because they're beneath our feet and out of sight. And so I think we need to really continue the progress that is already underway to better define than ever before our groundwater basins because they really are a critical link to um, putting more water back in the ground, exercising our basins. What we see in some er areas like Southern California have increased their uh, sustainable yield by two times by doing that, by truly understanding their basin. And I think that part uh, is really exciting. We'll be doing more of that and we need that local input uh, to guide us where to go on that as we go forward. So those are some um, overarching priorities that sort of weave in. And I think with the infrastructure and how it can be used in new and efficient ways uh, or operational ways, it really gets to that continued need to streamline the permitting uh, and the rules around it, knowing that we have a system in place that we have to honor and our colleagues at the board have to honor. And we're, we'll, we are, our leaders are bringing us together to talk through those issues and look for um, opportunities to streamline um, water right permits and different flood diversion and recharge rules, uh, which are critical for, for all this or a lot of this uh, action to happen. So I think that's another related priority to have the rules in place to utilize the infrastructure. Thank you, Stephen. So we're just about ready for audience Q&A. I want to remind you, if you have a question, for any of our panelists, submit to PPIC event questions at gmail.com. And before we pivot, I just want to take a minute for a lightning round with you all. Um, the charge is in five words or less, what inspired you the most about recharge efforts in 2023? Let's see. Stephanie. Growers willing to help. Is that four words? Growers willing oh, to help. Yeah, four. Perfect. Great. Okay. Jeevan. Trailblazed new opportunities. Cool. All right. John. Is it really limited to five words? 
Okay, I knew he would not yeah. be able to pass this <laughs> test. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I I would say um, willingness to to change or adapt in response to sigma. Great, and Stephen. I would say local state partnerships and creative solutions. Excellent. We have the makings of a haiku here somewhere, I think, folks. Yes. So with that, we're going to move to Q&A. And for the, the Q and audience Q&A part, I want to invite Katie back on the stage. And hi, Katie. OK, hi. so I am going to start. I've already got some questions that have come in. Um, and this is going to be, I think, a question that is going to be for the the folks, you know, could any of the panelists, but maybe, you know, so so let me know who wants to go first with this. This is a question from Ruth DeSol, who is a reporter with Bay City News, and she's wondering about land following. So this is sort of the demand management side of Sigma. Um, do folks have a sense of how many farmers have chosen to fallow land at this point um, in the process, and where are they? Where are you seeing them in the in the southern part of the valley? You know, Stephanie, I'm gonna. You're nodding your head, so you know it's definitely part of part of the thinking in your neck of the world. What are you seeing? Uh, so since we put allocations in place, we have seen about 10 percent of the land come out of production. Um, that doesn't mean that it's bare ground, though. There might be a cover crop or something else going on. But there, there is definitely land repurposing going on. And, and Jeevan, I know in a conversation that you and I had, I think demand management of the, of that type is is a piece of what you all are thinking about. Are you starting to see that planning play out? Yeah, we are a little bit. We, we see some opportunities to, um, as Katie mentioned earlier, um, uh, multi-benefit, multi-purpose. Uh, you know, we've got opportunities for flood um, protection. We've got opportunities with conservation being right next to, you know, to home ranch. Um, and we've got opportunities for solar being, you know, PG&E and Southern Cal Edison being in our backyard. So absolutely seeing some of that happening um, both due to Sigma and, and unfortunately, you know, the crop commodity pricing is, is, is not uh, at its best right now. So um, we have seen a, a high level of, of fallow ground. Anybody else on the panel want to chime in at all on the following I, I, question? I would chime in, um, Ellen. So I think the the estimate that PPIC put out a few years ago of 500,000 to 900,000 acres is generally accepted as what we anticipate will, will be fallowed. I think there's a heavy concentration in the South Valley, really Madera and South, um, and particularly um, on the west side of Fresno County and um, in, in the Kern County Water Agency portions of Kern County. Um, I think Sigma is playing a role. The imposition of allocations is playing a role. I also think we we happen to be in a in a tough um, market for for agriculture. Commodity prices are soft. Um, interest rates are high. Uh, the dollar is really strong, and that impacts exports. Um, so I think that there's a number of things going on. I will say, just piggybacking on what you even said about solar, I think that there are alternatives that are developing. Um, the solar development has has been underway in the valley going back at least 15 years, um, but I think that there's more of a concerted effort to focus on master planning and the development of uh, transmission infrastructure to unlock some of that value. And so I think that there are a number of macro factors that are driving the following. Got it. Okay, so now we're gonna switch back to recharge and um, David Guy from from NACWA, Northern California Water Association, who you know is is involved in in water water management works with water managers from across the Sacramento Valley. Um, they they are, are very interested in in expanding recharge up there too. They also are subject to to new requirements for groundwater basin management under Sigma, not in as much of a hole in the ground not as much of a hole in the ground as, as, as in the San Joaquin, but, but um, David is wondering, I guess, about insights about the, the temporary permit process that the state water board 
has in place that that is something relatively new that that is more ex, an expedited process for recharge, um, but still kind of a work in progress. And folks in in the Sac Valley have have had some frustrations, I think, with with making this work, similar to the kinds of things we've heard in some parts of the San Joaquin. So he's wondering if we have, you know, the panel here, any thoughts for or advice on how to how to work through this process um, and create a, a culture of success uh, on, on recharge. Wondering who would like to take that? Yeah, I can jump in first. Yeah, that's a good question. And because that, like, as you mentioned, and David highlighted, that's an area of a lot of um, action going on and both at the state level, because that temporary permit um, pathway is relatively new and it was it was spun up and the state board team and the water rights team put a lot of effort into changing of statute, creating programs, process, and then implementation in a fairly uh, short time frame. But you know our leaders are are still were have challenged us to continue to work together at across state agencies to see how it's going. Again, that Im critically important local feedback um, of what is or is not working so we can continue to shape that to where it can be as effective as possible and honor, again, the laws that are on, on the books, but also identify those uh, hurdles that persist that might need some type of uh, larger action going forward. Um, so I, I would say that um, that is taking place. Um, and, and so the more input on what is working or isn't working is important. And the board is actually having a workshop later this month to talk about those temporary permits. Um, and really they're an important message that's coming from the board uh, is submit those permits as soon as possible to allow for the process to take place uh, and then to have those permits in place uh, before the flood season starts. So the runoff season starts. Uh, and the, but that's also an opportunity with colleagues from the state um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and DWR will all be there uh, to provide input um, to all of us so we can take that back and feed that into the ongoing uh, staff and leadership discussions on the topic. So that that's what I'd add there. Thank you, Stephen. I think I'm going to pivot now to we have a question from Graham Fogg, who's known to many of you. Hi, Graham. Um, at UC Davis, who's one of the researchers who's been doing a lot of, of really um, compelling work on, on the recharge question. And, and Graham is wondering about the, the role of, of pumping fees um, as a potential, playing a potentially larger role in incentivizing both conservation and in setting the stage for monetary incentives. And I think he's got in mind here sort of the, the recharge net metering idea that that folks have been using in, in Pacro in the central in Central Coast as a as an example. Um, but I know, you know, Stephanie, you've got you've got pumping fees in place, right? Um in or maybe, maybe, maybe not quite yet. <laughs> so you've got allocations. So just wondering what your thoughts are there with respect to to the pumping fee question. I, I mean, it. that's a good question. Uh, so we, of course, you have to go through Proposition 218 in order to enact a fee, and we were um, sued and have an in temporary injunction on collecting fees. Um, and of course, probably we're saying your fees have to be tied to projects. You can't use them to create conservation, although charging for anything creates conservation. And Katie, do you want to just chime in on sort of what the sort of range of things we saw on the incentive side in terms of of paying paying growers to participate? Sure. Yeah, we we asked about a couple of different things on that front. Um, the by far the most common or widespread was pumping or allocation credits, which we talked a little bit about already. Um, but there are also some people using price reductions for recharge water, especially for uh, in lieu recharge, surface water bill reductions, uh, lease payments to be able to use 
um, landowner's property for recharge, as well as flood easements. So those were those were the things we asked about. There are probably others that are taking place as well. Great. And so so now we've got a question that's kind of related to that. And I, I, I want to see who would like to weigh in on this. This is about the accounting issue. If you're if you're compensating growers, either by giving them a credit or by paying them, sort of the way Jeevan, you're you're you know just paying folks directly. Um, John, you mentioned sort of Westlands, a, a bit of a, a mix there. Stephanie, you're providing credits. So if you're if if you're giving growers some kind of of, of a credit, um, how do you make sure that the accounting is not going to put you behind the eight ball um, down the road and that you're not paying too much or crediting too much relative to the water that's actually going in the ground. Who, so Stephanie, you were nodding your head the hardest. So oh, talk to us a little bit about how, how that's going. Yeah, so, uh, so we have worked with researchers like Graham and like Helen Dahlke trying to figure out if there are averages or what percent credit can you give when someone recharges. So we've done a lot of research on that. And the problem is that much of the research is looking at good projects, good conditions, things, sandy soil, winter weather, really ideal conditions. And so... Um, we have been able to use some research that Westlands had where they had an average of about a 75% credit overall. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of growing research that we would all benefit from if people were studying a wide range of projects. Because if 75% is the average, well, there's some that are less than that, right? Okay, I, now I we're would... gonna... Oh, yeah, oh. go ahead, John, go. No, go I was on. just going to add that I think that in areas, um, in terms of measuring the water that's going to recharge, I think most uh, districts are requiring meters as opposed to remote sensing. It, the remote sensing has some benefits, and I think the technology is continuing to improve, but I think meters are required in, in most areas. And then I think to Stephanie's point about Westland's, um, they they are trying to be nuanced about how much what the leave behind should be taking into account evaporative losses during the summertime and then also the infiltration rate of soils in Westlands. I'd say it's a it's a sophisticated way of looking at a lot of re, uh, water banks or recharge facilities just have an assumed average um, uh, leave behind and. Um, so I think that that's just going to be a, a, an evolving science over time. And if okay, I we have, in, oh, just yeah. for 30 seconds, I would just put a sure. plug in, if you haven't already heard about it, of the California Water Data Consortium and their water accounting platform. We've had the opportunity to fund them to really expand that, work with locals to test it out in different uh, scenarios. Uh, and they're developing guidance documents and have some more of that on the ground knowledge of how the accounting and allocations are really playing out. And so we're planning to synthesize that up eventually, but uh, the Water D Data Consortium Group is a great resource for more information on that. That's great. Thank you, Stephen, for mentioning that. Okay, we have about a minute left of Q&A before I have to close up. And there's a question about what needs to happen to expand the potential groundwater banks. So just, you know, Jeevan, you've got about the bank already. John, you're involved in some. Any any quick thoughts for folks on on next steps to to get that piece of the puzzle moving? Conveyance, make sure you can get the water to you. Yeah, I would I would add um, making sure there's um, some ability to store that water in the ground and some of the rules around that. Some clarification on that, uh, and then also continuing the ability to search and find a, a new places where banks can go that maybe haven't been um, utilized yet. Great. John, no final words on that? Uh, I would say landowner recharge programs with incentives. And then I would also say taking advantage of the wet periods, um, particularly in the Delta, and when there's an opportunity to um, move water southbound um, subject to environmental constraints, I would say we have homes for it and, and send us the water. 
Okay, Stephanie, I'm going to give you one last word there. If you've got I, one. I would just say, I, I mean, I'm very grateful that growers were able to step up last year. I mean, it, 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 it was transformative, I think, in getting them to problem solve Sigma. Awesome. Okay. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you and to the audience. Uh, really glad that you're able to tune in. We've reached the end of the program. So Katie, thanks for that great presentation. All of our panelists, thanks so much. Also want to thank the funders, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Kingfisher Foundation, Laurel Foundation, Sustainable Conservation, and the Water Foundation for supporting today's program. Thank you to all of you for joining us online. And we would appreciate if you take a moment to give us um, some feedback on this event. You can do that if you pre-registered, you'll get an email with a link, but you can also just scan your screen right now, go to, get that QR code and um, email us, uh, uh, respond to our survey and let us know how, how we can do better. Um, and thanks again, this will be available online for you. Um, in a, in, in a bit so you can watch it again or share it with folks. And we'll also have a, a, a video posting with a blog about it next week. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Have a great lunch and a good afternoon. Take care, bye now.